Good afternoon or good morning. Thank you so much for coming out to this uh, discussion about YouTube Premium's Impulse. Give it up. I'm Dan Feinberg from The Hollywood Reporter, and the people who you guys are here to see are backstage. We have from Impulse, Maddie Hassan, who plays Henry, or Henrietta if you prefer. And Missy Pyle, who plays Cleo. This top button breathe. of these pants doesn't, because at one point I will crouch and it'll just... Something to look forward to. <laughs> so the thing I like about the pilot and about the show is that you go through these waves of what you think the show is. You sort of start out without any preconceived notions, then you go, oh, it's, it's a jumper show. And then you go, oh, it's a high school teen coming of age show. Oh, it's a sexual assault dark drama. Oh, it's a superhero show. When you're getting the script, what are your initial reactions to the number of genres that you go through here? Well, I think that's a, that's a, I like the way that you said that. And I think that's why you've, we will often see if you read an article about it online, it's called genre bending, which I think to me initially, I was like, what's that even mean? It doesn't mean anything. Um, but I think it's because it can't really be pinned into sci-fi because it is, it's like a, a grounded drama about real people. It's very raw and gritty and sort of like an indie movie in my opinion. Um, but it has like a sprinkling of tele teleportation is like a side plot. You know what I mean? It's, like the, yeah, it's drama, drama first, sci-fi later, which I think was what Doug Lyman wanted to do initially. And I think Lauren LaFranc, when she got on board, really um, elevated the story and, and grounded it. Well, when the script gets passed along to you, though, what is the, what le what do they lead with? What do they say? Okay, it's a dot dot dot, or do they say it's a confusing show? That do you remember? You'll have they to. were like, it's I don't confusing. remember, but I th I think it was just you know it was we all knew that it was based on the Jumper series of books, and that was that that it was instead that of it, and, yeah. and it's the third book which is stars a uh, which is about a teenager a, t a girl, and so that's that's all we really knew. Yeah, and also the first script that I got was very different from what the show is now. It evolved. I mean, while we were shooting the pilot, we were rewriting every day. Not me. I didn't do any of that at all. Um, I, did I was just like, sure, rewrites. why not? I'll say that. Um, but yeah, it evolved a lot over time. So, And it is based on a book in the Jumper series, but it's not particularly based on that book did any did either of you guys read the book or did they say don't bother it's not really that yeah yeah i mean i did not read it yeah no i think that it, it that it has teleportation and it's a coming of age story about a young girl is about where the similarities end and YouTube Red just became YouTube Premium, I believe, yesterday, and, and they went through- Congratulations, YouTube. Muscle tough. Well done. Um, and, and they went through a period where everyone, even within the company, was joking, oh, YouTube Red sounds like a porn channel, ha, 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 it sounds like it's this, <laughs> it sounds like it's that. There are actually YouTube Red shows that make that joke. When you hear where the show is going to be, does anyone even think about that anymore in today's TV landscape, where a show is going to air, or do you just go, it's the material? Yeah, I think it, I mean, in my opinion, I'm not like an expert, but I, um, obviously, um, I think it's more about how good the show is now. I think everybody kind of watches all different networks, streaming services. It's about how good it is and if it trends on the internet. I think that's a huge part of it. I think too, well, I think there's always a little concern when uh, an another when someone else is jumping into the original programming, that it might just be a very crowded sea and that it would be very difficult for anything to kind of rise to the top. And I think for me, that was, um, I, I was like, oh, I wonder what this is going to be. And I remember too, getting an article forwarded to me about all the shows that are premiering this summer. And it was daunting. There were like every day, there was one day that had like 12 new shows and some of them were documentaries and other things, but I just was like, how, how difficult will it be for us to find an audience? And um, I think YouTube, you know, they do have billions of people, but then you do have to pay, you know, another $10. And so I, I think it's a little, but they do offer 
a lot of other things. I work for YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Premium. Not YouTube Red anymore. No. It was confusing. <laughs> In the early going, how big a draw is Doug Lyman up front, sort of that, that name and knowing what the brand is that he brings to the table? I mean, it's not not a draw. <laughs> you know, you don't read his name and are like, no, definitely not. Um, yeah, and he's wonderful. And when you meet him, he's such an experience. He has this very like childlike energy um, in life and on set because I think he truly just... He does this because he loves film and he loves characters. Um, and I think this was in particular and still is uh, a really big passion project of his because I think he didn't feel that he got Jumper right or the way that he wanted it to be. And I think it was important to him to revisit it and make it what he wanted. And Missy? Um, I had never worked, I, you know, I've done a lot of television and, and, and it's usually uh, very specific. You know, you come in, you rehearse a little, a little bit, you, then you film the, you know, you will film the, ma the master of the scene and you'll go in for coverage. It was nothing like that. There were certain, he knew exactly what, was, what he was looking for in his head. I didn't necessarily tell us, but, you know, <laughs> it was like you would do a scene and he would not necessarily get this side of your face yeah. in that scene and it was uh it was and that's he's this is the only one that he directed so you've all seen it and it went by very quickly and he does have this incredible energy it's it's like no one i've ever worked with and but it was exciting it does bring um something to the table i think especially with all of the competition of new shows out there to say that if you if you are a fan of his of his work you know you're gonna Chances are you'll check it out. And also he is active in every single episode, produced every episode, edited every episode. And he did something which I've never, um, I mean, I've done two other sh TV shows and I've never seen a director operate the camera. And he like would just, he would be like, you know what, let me, let me, let me just do this. And he would grab it and he would get in there and it was just really fun. It was a very close experience. <laughs> well, what is your reaction the first time you experience somebody doing that? I loved it. I love Doug. I just think he's the most fun, interesting person. And you mentioned the amount of rewriting and reconceiving that was going on yeah. in the pilot and going beyond. And for some people, that would be absolutely terrifying. Was it easy for you to just roll with the idea that this was a living, breathing thing and you just had to go on the journey? Yeah. I mean, shooting the pilot was very much like shooting an independent film, I think, because you kind of just had to roll with it. Um, but it was fun, and we were also like improving a lot, and I would be like, I don't want to say this, I want to say this, and there was a lot of freedom, and I think we maintained that level of freedom um, throughout shooting the entire show because YouTube Premium is a new network, and they allowed us to sort of do whatever we want. Like we say, you know, I'm probably not allowed to say the F word on this, it's being filmed, hey? Friendly. We say... Well, there's lots of swearing in the show, as you've seen, but there's swearing in real life. Teenagers swear more than any other, you know, type of person. Most, so, mostly. Mostly. Other than Missy. Not today. It's not going to happen. Well, how about you, Missy? Do you, do you have trepidation when things are getting rewritten and reconceived as you're going along right at the beginning? Um, I think so, so much of what was being rewritten was more your stuff, I, I, right? I mean, I, yeah, yeah so I, I, listen, I am so excited to get a job, I'm not even kidding, that I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, bring it, um, this was really fun for me because I got to be, uh, I got to be, um, in not it wasn't it's not necessarily a comedy um and i got to really do some challenging stuff so i was really thrilled uh to do it and i, I always like a ch it's, if it's you know i did i did another movie recently where um i i came to the set and it was like five hours after i'd been maybe even nine hours after i had been called that the, the dawn was beginning to <laughs> come up again i'm off topic you're welcome um <laughs> And I was like rehearsing a scene and one of the actors was like, oh, I'm not gonna say that. And the other one was like, oh, I'm not gonna say that. And I was like, well, who's directing this? That, that kind of stuff is tricky. And then I was like, oh, I wrote you a new monologue. I'm gonna text it to you. So I got a texted monologue, you know, right before a scene on that movie. And it was, 
it was harrowing, but it ended up working, but that, that was a little hard. This was nothing like, <laughs> sorry. Went off, I went off topic. Thank you. I'm not gonna lead you back in this time. <laughs> you are on your own today. Well, I was watching the two of you interact back in the green room, and it's obvious that you guys have a lot of fun and that you have a lot of funny when you guys are interacting. Um, how important is that, having sort of a, a touchstone who you can laugh with when things are getting dark on set? We cried a lot on set, too. <laughs> we cried a lot, too. It's very nice. I, we got so lucky with, because we had never met before. Um, and you, you were cast when we were all already out yes. in Toronto. So I was like, who's my mommy going to be? I don't know. Yeah. And we are really, really... So much. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> we um, love each other so so much. I I don't think I have a connection like with anybody. It's, I saw a post that no. you did about Towns and Jenna. It's okay. I but that's a superficial love. Okay. You know, that's just for the show. <laughs> just checking. <laughs> okay. I think um, this what was the question. This was a particularly hard show to shoot. We had to relocate ourselves to Toronto in the winter. Um, I had a very young daughter that I took by myself, and I was in, I mean, it, it was hard. It was really hard, and also, there was, it was really difficult subject matter. It gets, it gets uh, even more intense, um, especially for me, and I could never have, to, I mean, I don't know what, it, I just don't know what it would have been like if it hadn't been for Maddie. You are so talented and raw, but just more of a, like, it was like being with someone in the trenches, and it really, and in a, in a great, and it was very challenging. I enjoyed it. It was tough, but I enjoyed it. And it was, it, it, it we, oftentimes, I mean, I wasn't sure who was the teenager and who was the parent. Um, and it was a really lovely experience. I, I don't know how I could have done it without you. And I prepared a song that I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I really did. <laughs> I'm a band came out. <clears throat> Well, one of the key changes, obviously, as the show was sort of finding itself, was the addition of uh, Lauren LaFranc as showrunner. She was not originally on the show. When she came in, what did you immediately see her and feel her bringing to the material and, and to the show? Well, for one thing, when she came on board, um, and I've done a few series. Uh, I haven't done as, that many, but I, from pilot to series, um, when she came on board, she wanted to have a meeting with all of us as, uh, and wanted to talk about, she said, one of the things she said to me was, you know, you, we constantly are talking about you all as characters, but very rarely do we ever let the actor know that because they, I think they're worried about breaking the story or, you know, getting you the scripts too early because you might be like, oh, I want to switch this or, mm -hmm. just kidding. But the, uh, she had a two hour conversation with me and I was just like, oh, I'm gonna go do the show, I'll figure out. And I just kind of, I've always been sort of a layman going to work and she sat with me and told me the story of, of uh, the whole season and the arc of the characters, all the characters, my own character. She talked about Cleo as being someone who'd given up on her dreams and I literally almost like choked and thought about like how I had kind of given up on the idea of being a dramatic actor because you know, once you hit a certain age, it's harder and harder, and there's, you know, it's harder and harder to get roles in general. And I was like, I was just blown away by her, her ability to craft story and, and her, the eloquence in which she, you know, she parlays it. That was pretty eloquent. Thank you. But she, uh, she really came in and, and, and brought in, she took the reins of this story, which was already really incredible, and then made it her own. Maddie, go ahead. You did such a good job. Thank you. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna say, actually. I wish Lauren were here. She texted us last night and she's like, I'm not coming. Um, she has a baby. She has a baby voice as well. Why did I do that voice? Um, she came in and she knew exactly what the show needed. Um, and I mean, we had incredible people, a part of it already, producing, directing, um, wonderful actors. <sighs> I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Um, but she knew exactly what it needed, and so she decided because the I I don't know if you guys know this, but we reshot the assault scene, and that was Lauren's idea. 
um, because it was sort of, you know, it happened, and then like many other assault scenes and many other TV shows, movies, it was sort of passed over. And Lauren said, no, you don't understand. When this happens in a woman's life or anyone's life, it's a part of her life forever. It's a part of her story forever. And this happens when she learns that she can teleport for the first time. So those two things have to be linked. We can't pass this over. We have to reshoot this scene. We have to make it real. And we have to make this a part of her storyline. Um, and so she sat me down in the same way that she sat down Missy. And she um, went over all of that with me. And I, it was very sort of daunting to me at first and intimidating. Um, but it's a really worthwhile story to tell. Um, and she had already met with a bunch of... Um, a, a few victims of assault and therapists that specialize in, in assault. And, and I ended up meeting with a therapist who meets mostly with victims of assault and spoke to her at length because we didn't want it to be gratuitous in any way. We wanted it to be from the female perspective and we wanted it to be real, which I hope that we did. Well, from your point of view, how would you describe the difference between the original assault scene that was shot and how it was then reconceived? I think, and Doug has said this to me and in interviews, so I think I can speak for him on this. I think he was very, he was just a little bit uncomfortable in shooting it. And I don't think it was that he didn't want to touch on that subject. I think he was just... I don't know. I think he just didn't know how far he could go, how far he wanted to go. And he was just felt uncomfortable and didn't have that understanding that I think as a woman you grow up having, as a woman you grow up with this fear of walking alone at night. You grow up this fear of parking lots. You grow up this fear of, uh, with this fear of being taken advantage of. And you learn this at about, I don't know, 10, 12 years old. So it's something that's ingrained in you. And I think it took... Well, Lauren, because I think she's truly a genius, but also it took a woman kind of stepping in and saying, no, this, you know, this is something we can't pass over. Um, so it was just, it wasn't as, it didn't go as far, it wasn't as, as, as visceral the right word? No. Um, I think it was just uh, maybe more raw, if that makes sense. Yeah. It felt... And it was more from Henry's point of I view. I think so. I think that was mainly... The, the scene now. And one thing that's notable, in addition to sort of the ramifications and the ripples of the incident playing out throughout the entire series, there are at least a half dozen different variations from different perspectives of the assault scene, sort of how he might have seen it, how she wonders if it was in her mind. Um, what is your response to going in and having to do that scene, not just multiple times the first time around, but then doing variations on it? Yeah, we did that all, we shot that all on the same day, actually. When we reshot the assault scene, we shot all of the, the reimaginings of the scene. Um, and it was really difficult. I didn't want to be in that car. I'd never want to see that car again. I really do. I had nightmares about it um, because we did want it to be so real. So you have to go to a place that is not a fun place to go to, but it matters to go to that place because this is a real thing that happens to people. I mean, when you become an adult, you know so many people that have been assaulted, that have been raped. I know so many people I couldn't count on two hands actually. Um, and, and so it, it matters to make it real and for it to hurt. And from your perspective, what are sort of the changes that you like to have happen on set on days like that? Like, like, do you want there to be fewer people? Do you want there to be fewer people sort of standing off on the sides? Do you need it to be sparse? Um, it is nice when they're, I mean, you know, you, you want them to be able to do their jobs, obviously. And that's as important as you being able to do your job. But it is nice when it's not as many people all over. And I think, you know on our set, they, they were very careful to make sure that we were really comfortable and felt safe and, you know, as, as safe as you can feel. I, I think it's hugely significant that after Doug directed the first episode, I believe seven of nine were directed by women after that, which is yeah. remarkable. And 
was that something that Lauren mentioned to you when she came on that she wanted to be kind of a part of the background of the show? Um, she didn't mention it to me when she came on, but I think, well, first of all, those women were the right people for the job. Um, but second of all, I think that female directors are overlooked partially because some of them don't have the experience, but on the other side of that coin, they don't have the experience because they're a woman and they're overlooked. You know what I mean? So it just keeps going back and forth between those two things. And you're like, when am I going to get a chance? Um, so I think she did make it a point to say, I want this to be mostly female directed because it's a female driven story. I mean, our four leads were all women, Missy, Sarah, me, Anuka. So yeah, it's very much a female led, female driven story. How did you feel that difference on set, Missy? I've never experienced, I think in my in my life I've had very few maybe a handful of female directors and I've worked with so many male directors and it's I mean it, it, again I think they were all right for the job and I think that that's the most important thing but it was really exciting it just was uh it was very exciting to to talk to a woman especially as a, a female character it, and I think not that I don't think a man could have and we did have some incredible male directors too and it was an incredible uh we have really, really talented male actors on the show too, but it just was, I think because it does, it, it does come from a, a girl, the story it did feel. It's cool. Now Maddie, I wanna talk about one particular scene at the end of the second episode without spoiling specifically what it is. It's effectively a minute long, possibly longer, just a close up on your face as you sort of reflect on the assault and go through kind of a, a journey of understanding and the camera doesn't move. There's no editing. It's just right up there in your face. What was that day of shooting like? And how many times did you have to do that to get the right emotions? I guess. Um, I, that was our first day shooting back shoot. Cause we shot the pilot months went by, it got picked up and that was the first day um, and the last scene on the first day. So we started off hot. Um, and I did the first take of it, and Alex directed that episode, didn't she? And she was happy with the first take, came back, and she hugged me, and I just started sobbing more, um, because sometimes it just takes somebody touching you when you're already sort of in that space, and it really kind of clicks. And then there were two cameras moving around constantly, and I don't think we really cut. We just kept going um, for quite a long, quite a long time. And I, 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 it, it hurt, and I, it was real pain. Um, and at the end of the day, I've never had a headache. I never knew you could get a headache from crying, but you can. And I was sore the next morning as well. Um, so that I don't know what was that day like. <laughs> Is, is that the kind of thing where you can then watch that, where you can watch dailies of it, where you can watch the final episode, or, or can you not watch that yourself? I don't like, I've only seen the first, the pilot episode before we reshot the assault scene and one of the other scenes. Um, and I haven't seen any of the other episodes. I saw part of, I saw some of the reshot assault scene in ADR on accident because I said please don't let me see that and they did um, but they're really nice people they didn't do it on purpose and it, yeah it's not fun to watch now uh, Missy I want to go back to what you were saying about sort of the the overlap with you and with Cleo and sort of the idea that you had maybe given up on <laughs> which which seems like an odd thing to say because you're really extremely prolific you you, you pop it feels like you're pop constantly on my TV but you're constantly being funny on my TV. Had you been looking for the I chance to not be funny, but to but to you know step away from that and to try out different colors? Um, yeah, I, you know, I I became um, uh, I started doing comedy when I was in college. When I had I had a boyfriend who was in an all male sketch group, so I f formed an all female sketch group right when I got out of college um, called Bitches Funny. That's not swearing. Um, and, and we were, it was, it was fun. And I, I really, I mean, when I got out of college, I went to drama school and moved to New York and got an agent, started working with Paradigm kind of right away when I was 
young. I was like 22. And I auditioned for everything under the sun. I mean, I auditioned for a lot of drama. I had constantly was auditioning for... And I did a play at Steppenwolf uh, with John Malkovich when I was like 22, playing his wife. It was very dramatic um, and terrifying. And uh, and but I just found a, a niche in comedy. I found it. I, I think a lot of people that I was just I was very tall, so it was hard to imagine me as the date of someone. I was like wearing flats to that audition, and um, which I didn't usually do. But and then I just it, it it just was easier for me to find that like the, to hear the laugh is like oh, and then you can kind of you know move around it. It's really fun to do, and it makes sense to me. Um, drama doesn't always make sense to me, and uh, but going going there. It, so so, um, I just think it's I think it's more difficult uh, to be present and real and without the laugh or without the acknowledgement of oh this is going you're in the right direction. Um, but this show in particular, I was just again I mean, I had a daughter and I I was feeling like I wasn't a good parent and then. When I remember meeting with Lauren LeFranc, who's our showrunner, and she's saying saying that Cleo has left, um, dragged this girl around like every six months. And I was like, does it have to be every six months? <laughs> Couldn't there have been a time when I stayed for like three years or something, or we were by ourselves for a while? Was I always looking for a man? And it was just like, oh my God, come on, Cleo, pull yourself together. And at the same time, I was having, you know, we were shooting this in Toronto. It was very cold, and I had a two-year-old that I'd, We'd moved to Canada, and I was by myself, and just, it was very hard to feel like I was being a good mother, and just for whatever reason, it I was able to bring that in to just, I was like, just go right in there, uh, into that character of just like not really knowing and trying something out, and, and also I'd never been a parent before, uh, I mean, you know, in a dramatic, I'd played a lot of parents, but, but, but I hadn't had my own child, and just how, um, how often you don't know what you're doing and as a parent and like how often you're like let's do this and, and like putting on a face of like let's go we're gonna make I'm gonna do this right and it just you know and only afterwards do you know that you've either done a good job or you've screwed the whole thing up and <laughs> you can apologize and hopefully <laughs> you know humans are resilient well since actors primarily like anyone else want to work is there point in your career where you go from the yay I have a niche because that means I'm working all the time to uh oh my niche might be typecasting maybe that's a problem or do you do you feel that there was sort of a turning point where you began to feel that way I definitely do get offered a lot of like bitchy white ladies you know I get offered that a lot I've played that a lot I just got offered I just did one uh, recently and I, I think the challenge for me is to not make it uh, to get to give it a um, give that person a real, give them three dimensions and a story and so that it isn't just the person who's coming in and doing, and, and a lot of times, you know, I had a director say to me recently like, all right, just come out of the office and do something funny, you know, and, and, and like, I'm okay, I, I'm okay, I like a challenge, so I'm okay with that and I can, you know, it's fun to see what happens, but to play a similar character like that can be really daunting and uh, to get that same offer over and over again, but, uh, and to, to try to make them different or um, is is definitely a challenge. And back in the green room, people were, people, no, totally an answer, because back in the green room, people were mentioning roles of shows you had been on. I'm so is sorry, guys. Is there a wish that you're supposed to? No, no, no. <laughs> Season two. Keep going, it's fine. <laughs> um, please, you so please, you too, premium. <laughs> And you were talking about sort of a couple different roles and people were mentioning shows and you were like, oh, and you immediately had a sense of recall. What is your level of recall of all of the guest starring roles you've done? Are there things where people mention and you just have no memory of that week of your life and that character at all? There are things I, I'd like to forget. <laughs> Characters that I've played that I would like to forget, but I remember every single one of them. Uh, and sometimes... It is, it's also funny to get older and look back at something and be like, who is that? Who's that baby up there? Um, which one day will happen. Um, uh, but I do remember, I remember all of them. I do, I did, there's a one photo shoot that I, somebody sent me a photo of and I can't recall the photo shoot, but I, I think you can have booze when you're doing a photo shoot. 
I, that's what I can only attribute the absolute inability to remember that photo shoot. Next question. <laughs> Now, this is sort of touching on uh, one of the other sides of the show. Obviously, this is from George. What do you find is the most challenging about performing in a series where special effects play such a huge part? Sometimes it can take quite a long time. Um, there's a scene in episode two, right before the last, um, the second time my character teleports. And on this show, because we want the teleporting and, and all of the effects to look so real, we do um, VFX and physical effects. Is that the right way to say? I'm not an expert. Um, Practi so, Practical. so good. The, <laughs> so the, the, and the things don't always go exactly how you want them to. So we spent from breakfast to lunch this whole morning shooting this one scene because it can, it can take a long time to make it look good. Um, but I think it, it ended up looking good. So that's, yeah. Did I answer a question? You answered a question. I guess that's the most challenging. Well, how much honestly, no, go ahead, Missy. No, I was going to say, I didn't do much of it, but we did have one incredibly intense, uh, scene towards the end, um, with the, with a green screen. And that was, I mean, that was nuts. And I, then I was like, oh, you guys have been doing this the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how much, honestly, really did you have to do effects work? Because there are whole episodes that go by where it's 50 minutes of drama and then maybe somebody teleports once from one place to another. How, how much effort does that 30 seconds take as opposed to the rest of it? Takes a lot. I mean, there's a scene, uh, am I allowed to, whatever. There's a scene where I sort of almost drown. Um, episode three, watch out, it's free. Um, <laughs> And that we had to shoot in a quarry. She jumps into the quarry a couple of times, which I wasn't allowed to do that because it was very tall and I would have handled it poorly. Um, and she, you know, tries to sink to the bottom. And so we shot part of that there and then part of that at a pool. And I had to climb down this ladder to sort of unnaturally sink myself into the pool when all I wanted to do was get out. Um, so they take, I mean, it takes a long time, but it's like with any other scene, it takes a long time and it's done in a second when you watch it. Well, what is the different preparation like for a day that's going to be that day versus... Yeah, there was training, especially for the, the underwater stuff, because they were like, can she swim? We don't have that kind of confidence in her. And turns out I'm not good at holding my breath, actually. And so I would come up, like the first time I came up and coughed up water and did it every time. And they're like, that's not how you, nobody holds their breath like that. And so what is the secret to correct no, breath holding? No, you just, I don't know. <laughs> Do not wear those pants or You don't dress. wear these pants. I have to imagine air bubbles are like the major problem with that, right? Or is there something more You know what? When I swim, I always hold my nose. Oh. And I wasn't allowed to do that. Surprise, surprise. Um, so I think that was the main issue. The what about you when you swim? What do you do when you swim? Let's talk about my swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. Don't, I don't want to brag. That's fine. I can hold my breath for like three pool lengths. <laughs> Still got it. Is that on your acting resume that you can? Listen, yes. I, my acting resume, my special skills is three pages. <laughs> it's just special. It's just <laughs> Obviously, if the show goes forward, it, it feels as if it's the story is progressing more in the direction of Henry using her powers more when you kind of imagine a show that becomes bigger, more effects driven, et cetera, what excites you about that prospect and what kind of worries you about it? The travel. The travel. The, see this? It's Sorry. happening already. Um, I'm not going to button it up again because I'm just not that small. Um, the travel is exciting. I did, we did travel somewhere at the episode 10 um, that's very, very far away from Toronto. Um, and that's exciting and, you know, intimidating. What, I, what sorry, I didn't mean to answer that. What's, what about the, 
I don't remember. I just got excited. You said the I travel, was hoping and I was that like, I can travel. be holding her like this when she goes to Paris and teleports. <laughs> Yeah, and I can get lost in Paris. I have some ideas to pitch. Cleo spends a, a season in Paris in the summer, but I but like the spring. I Thank think you. though her powers will evolve and she will get better control over them. I don't think you'll ever really see Henry being like a hero. I don't think necessarily, and I know that Doug doesn't want this. When she gets control over her powers and she can actually do it, I don't think she's going to handle it well. Um, I don't think she's going to immediately start having this amazing moral compass, you know. However, when she passes the powers on to Cleo, she will save the world. Save the world. Thank you. Well, how much do you sense, Missy, that Cleo knows about about Henry's father and sort of these how, how much did she expect this to be coming somewhere in her, you know, in her gut? Well, I, I don't know how much I can say uh, without people watching. You know, I do know that her, her father did leave me, and I do not suspect that. Um, I think, well, it's interesting. We talked about the reimagining of the assault scene. I think, you know, I was thinking about when you were saying that, how often we re-reimagine, at least I don't want to speak for all of you, but I'll, I'll do it this once. When, you know, you have an experience and you just so wish it could have gone another way. And, you, and I was thinking how often I have done that when I have done something that I, was a choice that either I, I, why did I get into the car? Why did I go, you know, if only I hadn't, what, da, da, da. And I think with her husband, you know, having her, the father of, of Henry, with her dad, sorry. when he leaves, <laughs> I, um, I think she probably played it over and over and over in her head. Um, and I don't think she would have ever imagined that he, um, she wouldn't. Know, she just wouldn't know why he left, and so she would try to imagine, you know, a better circumstance for it. But I, I don't think that she um, knows. I mean, I guess it's a big leap from oh he was a jackass to oh he was a teleporting superhero or something. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that she knows that that's the case. Um, but I think that she is has wondered but i the idea i don't uh, the, the henry has seizures you know so i don't know why she's having these seizures and they're very you know complicated and i don't have a very good job and i'm trying so hard to be a better mother and get more money so they can help her uh, with these seizures that nobody understands you know and it ends up so she's teleporting and trying to tell me and there, there's all we have so many misconnections and 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 this the series goes on of just her trying to talk to me and me not being able to, or you know me being excited about a new job and her not being able to tell me what's going on with her and so I don't know why I stare at you so much when you talk <laughs> guys are gonna have to cut that out in the edit the sag edit just crop me out <laughs> Maddie, these seizures look spectacularly unpleasant and uncomfortable to perform. What was the degree of sort of research and consultation you had to go through to get those to look realistic or to honor a real experience of something like that? Um, I, I watched a lot of YouTube videos of people having real seizures. Um, and so did Doug. We actually, I think, had watched one of the same videos before we met. And I was like, okay, we're on the same page. Um, and I spoke to somebody who I know personally who has seizures and has experienced that. And I asked that person, what did it feel like? What did your family members say it looked like? Um, because we wanted to make it real. And I think also with young adult shows and with young female characters, there's this... I don't know. You often, when they're having a real experience, try to make them likable or try to make them look pretty. And I went into it very, you know, intent on saying this has to be ugly. It has to be real. I'm not going to have a quote unquote pretty seizure because I'm a girl. And nobody luckily had that intention. So I didn't have to make that argument, um, which on in a different, you know, group of people, you might actually, you might have to make that argument, which is unfortunate. Have you had a comparable experience on another show or in a movie where people have wanted you to do something quote unquote pretty as opposed to real? You know, I think I think that especially as a young woman and I've played young women, um, I've played mostly 16 year old girls. I, and 
I think there's this misconception that because you're a 16 year old girl, you have to be likable. And that if you're having a feeling, it means that you're angsty or bratty or I don't know, whatever other stupid fucking word they use to describe your feelings. Um, and it's very frustrating. Uh, and I think that you can feel that hand, however gently, trying to mold you into something that people can smile at. Where do you feel that hand coming from? Is it a production? Do you feel it coming from the quote unquote network? I mean, I'm not going to like name names. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've, had, I've had, had mostly very good experiences, but there are some, yeah, you will feel from some, some networks or from some particular directors saying, can you tilt your chin this way when you're crying? And, you know, and you're like, what? I'm crying, you know? Um, yeah, but it's, I think, mostly just singular people. And have you grown more confident since when you started in, in sort of saying, no, I, I'm not going to go that way? I think, yeah, because I started when I was 16 and now I'm 23. You learn that you're allowed to say no and you learn that you're allowed to have a voice. I think as a, a woman, you grow up thinking, oh, you know, I want to be likable. I want people, you know, I don't want to raise my voice too loud. I don't want to... You know, and you realize you have to stand up for yourself because nobody else will. Missy, are there things that you find yourself standing up for yourself on in similar ways consistently? I mean, I, you know, for so long I was so excited to get a job. Uh, I would look at the producers, you know, three chairs there and just be tim intimidated by them uh, when I was younger. I really found it hard to, you know, I just kind of would do what I was told to do. And I really think it's a, it's a different time right now. I was thinking when you were talking about like, just the idea like YouTube was so, and this is something that I remember, you know, Dave Bardis, one of our other producers is not here in the last interview, just the freedom that they gave, so, you know, to this production and they were so new in doing this too that it was almost like a collaboration of just like, I've never been a part of anything like this, you know, where it's so, um, the, the stories flow in and out of each other and it feels like the lighting is oftentimes, you know, it's like the opposite of like, let's make it pretty. I'd be like, are they always going to shoot me from underneath? Can we have one light? <laughs> one that, that we could come down from here? But the idea that, you know, it's, to me, uh, I was answering like three questions there, but like it is a newer thing for me to, to feel the confidence to be able to, and I, uh, to um, speak up about things that you know may may not be right for me or the character, and I do see the younger generation is a lot easier for them, and I think that that's pretty thrilling. That leads, I think, well into the last question, which comes from AJ Billions, and it's basically that is a serious. Is that a mustache? Yeah. You, guys you also have that out. <laughs> you also have to know that the S at the end of his name is a dollar sign. Sure. Cool. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> What is the best advice you have name. ever received? That's a, I don't ever know what to say to that question. What if we turn it into what's one of the best pieces of advice? That sounds that, perfect. I still can't figure that out. <laughs> what is one of the top 10 pieces of advice? Mm -hmm. Not the top 10, but one Sigourney of Sigourney Weaver once told me to steal my costume. <laughs> did you? I did. Sigourney Weaver. She said, she reached over and hugged me and said, steal your costume. <laughs> and I did, and then I donated it to my old high school for like a charity auction, and now I want to get it back from John Kosky, who bought it. And so I can donate it again and then buy it back again and wear it. It's my Galaxy Quest costume. It's just a little piece of tr that's Sigourney what Weaver I, trivia. That's what I know you from. My... <laughs> My dad and I used to watch Galaxy Quest. Are you Quest. just now figuring that out? No, I'm, I oh. said it in an interview and I actually made myself sound like a mega fan of yours, which is <sighs> true, I'm a fan but I didn't want you to know. Let's talk about this afterwards. Um, I'm sure it was advice that I gave you, right? It was. You said, <laughs> don't do that. And I was doing an, a face in a scene and you said, that's not a good face. <laughs> didn't we just talk about... Um, there are no bad faces. Yeah, hmm. but she, you're not. Never to me. I'm old school, guys. Um, I don't know. 
actually. And that's going to be my answer. I'm trying to think of like a really good piece of advice. I've gotten so many. I'll remember when I get You know, my publicist said, if you don't have an answer to a question, don't answer it. And I'm going to take it now. And that's actually, that's my answer. <laughs> that I have a great piece of it. I remember I got circle. one piece of advice I really liked. It was from, I was doing Josie and the Pussycats with, um, oh God, what's his name? Alan uh, Cumming. And uh, it kind of mirrored some of the things that I had heard in college, but it was like, you can, uh, don't be afraid of going too big as long as it's real. Um, because I think people, we all know people who are larger than life and that's, and like you can always cut back, but you can't add more to the piece of fabric, you know? So it's like, to me, I always thought that was really interesting because I, some of my first characters were based on people in my life that I was afraid to, ha to, to, be, to live as largely as they did. And, um, and it was real. And so I kind of think that was a good one for me. Okay, so steal costumes, don't be afraid to go too big, and if you don't know the answer to the question, don't answer it. Thank you very much to Maddie Hassan and to Missy Pyle. Thank you. And to all of you for coming out.